How's the old man? I wish you wouldn't call him that. How is he? Thinking. I think you should prepare yourself for the I know all the perceived... morphine. They've upped the morphine. Again. It's that close. He's not really with us. Shall we go in? Father? You see? Yes. I suppose you've been at the library today, Matty. Oh, yes. I've been asked to do some research for a theatre company. Elizabethan costume. Did you know that the young men in the 16th century often wore leather caps? I suppose things never change. I'm sorry, I don't understand. No, I suppose you wouldn't. Well, there's no need to have a go. Sit here beside me. Well, I can't, Father. I'd upset all the tubes and trips and things. Sit here. Very well. It never really occurred to me, but human gestures remain the same. Elizabethan sewing women, for example. They sat on the floor, cross-legged. People have sewn that way for thousands of years. To see eternity as a part of time and time as a part of eternity. I'm sorry, Father. These days we've got machines. Something is coming through the veil. Father? Machines on tables. You sit at a chair. Let me brush your coat, good doctor. Do you hear this music? It is the music of the spheres. Do you know these shining lanes and alleys? The river of pearl. And the lighted towers rising into the blue mists. What does he think? Well, I, I think it's the feed, the drip and the tubes. It's as old as the universe, Matthew. And the city from which you first came. Don't listen to him. Don't believe him. Mother. The House of Dr. D by Peter Ackroyd. Dramatized by Alan Drury with Nigel Anthony and Philip Glenister. You can't just leave him. Oh, like, what do you know about it? He's not got all his faculties. It should be nice and peaceful here. Everything under control. Well, I suppose you'd like pipe music, nice Pink pyjamas and a matching balloon Shh. tied to the bed rail. There is such a thing as holy dying, you know. <laughs> you sound just like him. And why not? So why are you here? Why aren't you sitting in a churchyard like he used to, talking about ghosts and all his other nonsenses? He wouldn't mind. He'd understand. Oh. <sighs> Do you love him, Matty? No. I don't know. Everyone uses that word, but I don't think it means anything. That's my opinion, too. The world gets on well enough without it. Don't. Oh. Let's... Yes. We're here. Do you smell... My decay. Matty. It, it means my change is coming. And I will be restored. I don't like This is your work, good doctor. This is all your work. We should call a real doctor, Do you obviously. Feel the light coming through the stones of this wonderful city. Matty! Can you 
you feel the warmth of the true fire that dwells in all things? We should... What are you doing? Just looking at the river. Ah. My father's just died. I'm very sorry. It's all right, you didn't know him. Daniel, do you ever see things out of the corner of your eye? Or rather, not see them? I mean, they'd be there if you turned your head quickly enough. There's a bridge of houses. A shimmering bridge lying across the Thames. Shimmering across the water. There are people crossing it along a line of light. They rise and fall together as if they were walking across waves. If only I could turn my head quickly enough. So, he's left everything to you? Yes, he has. It's so unfair. It's me that had to put up with him. Mother, I'm sorry. I don't see you've got anything to be sorry about. Is there much? Um, it's an office building in Barnstable. It's a block of flats in Ilfracombe. Some commercial land outside Cardiff. A lock-up garage in Wapping, Ealing, this house, and another house in Clerkenwell. Clerkenwell? Yes. Well, I knew about the West Country in Wales. Sometimes he'd be off down there. But Clerkenwell? It's probably let out. No, it isn't. What did he want it for? Huh. <sighs> So here am I, after 35 years of marriage, thrown on the mercy of my own son. Mother, it isn't like that. No, I suppose it isn't. I suppose in principle, it is my money too. I'll get it. He's here. I don't know why you call this healing. It's active. Let's get it over with. Matty, this is Geoffrey. Hello. Hello. He's an old dear friend of mine. Your mother said uh, such a lot about you. Well, I'm surprised we haven't met before. Matty, I was thinking at some point in the near future of asking Geoffrey to move in with us here. I see. They're amongst us always, but which is us and which is them? Spare any change, mister. I'm sorry, I... What? Is it you? Are you here, after all? I'm afraid you... You know about the shit on the streets, don't you? It's not the dogs, it's the old age pensioners. And on the day they'll all go back, back where they came from under the ground. I presume that, as usual, I'm too early. I was expecting it. Well, welcome to Nightmare Abbey. How old is this house? Well, you tell me, you're the one who knows. The ground floor footage looks mid-18th. The door on the fan line? Yes, but look up there. Top story. It's Victorian, yellow brick. And the mouldings. Shall we go in? I've got the key. Very impressive. What a pity, I was expecting it to creep. Did you hear anything? What? I don't know. I didn't hear anything at all. The outside world, gone. Now... This definitely isn't mid-18th. It's older. Much older. I agree. 16th? Possible. It's very unusual to find a house this age in London. Especially somewhere like Clerkenwell. Where should we start? 
Oh, we should be systematic. Do you think there's a cellar? Uh, try this door over here. What makes you say that? Oh, well, houses are basically the same. I, um... Matthew? And you're right. Steps down. Careful. You think there's rats? Well, of course. Enormous ones. Ow, something touched my face. It's just a cord for the light. This isn't a cellar. It's a proper room. Yes. 16th again. Do you notice anything, Daniel? What? It's completely clean. There's no dust. <laughs> There's no smell of damp, either. There was a door here, Matthew. Do you, do you see where it's been sealed up? Oh, yes. It must have opened near the Fleet River. What do you make of this? Where the lintel used to be? Why aren't they just scratches? No, they, they look like symbols. Well, builder's marks. Possibly. Do you know what I think? This wasn't the basement at all. This was the ground floor. And it has slowly sunk through the London clay. The old house is slowly descending into the ground. We ought to find out who's owned this house. It's almost a professional duty. I'm not sure I want to know. Of course, now you're rich, you'll be giving up our old pursuits and taking I'm not giving up my work just because of money. Well, let me finish. If you're otherwise engaged, I'm quite prepared to do a little digging myself. No, don't. It's my house. How far do you intend to go? Right back. Right back to the beginning, if possible. Where next? In ghost stories, they always explore the attic. We're going to be systematic. Systematic? Well, how about the room under the stairs? I don't think there is one. I think you'll find there's at least a cupboard here. How did you know it was there? There's always a cupboard under the stairs. Haven't you read Lady Cynthia Asquith? Now, what's in here? Pipes. I wonder if you get your water from the Fleet River. Oh, hello. What's this? A box of toys. Child's toys. Glove puppet. Rag book. Oh, yes. I remember these. They were my toys. What are they doing in this house? Put them away, quick. Matthew! Matthew Palmer! Where's my little sprout? Coming, Mother. Oh, there you are, darling. Hello, Geoffrey. Hello, Matthew. We couldn't keep away. Come in, come in. Look, this is Daniel Moore. Pleased to meet you. And, and this is Geoffrey. Hello. Hello. Haven't I seen you before? Not as far as I know. Well, there's something familiar about you. It'll come to me in a moment. I'm afraid I must be going. <laughs> yes, I seem to have that effect on people. An appointment. Uh, see you, Matthew. Um... Yes. Quiet in here. Who is he? He's a friend of mine. He's another researcher. We use the same libraries, cover a lot of the same topics. I wish I knew where I'd seen him. Hmm. Oh. Well, now. Your father was a dark horse. Fancy keeping all this to himself. I suppose he used it for a bit on the side. I don't think, Mother, it's that sort of house. How would you know? <laughs> well, never mind. Where's the lover gone? Uh, just poking around. <laughs> You'll uh, probably get a good price for this. I'm not putting it on the market. Really? I'm going to live here. <gasps> but you're not going to sell up Ealing? No, of course not. It's yours. Well, my darling, you're a better man than your father. Ooh. Such a lot of dust here, typical of him. Uh, well, aren't you going to give me the grand tour? Well, I haven't finished it myself yet. I'll show you what I've seen, then we'll do the rest together. <gasps> what was that? Uh, what? I thought I saw something move. Over there. Uh, it's probably just a fly. Oh, there it is again. 
Didn't you see it? No. No. It was like some creature, some little thing. It's the old girl's eyes. All sorts of bits and pieces floating in them at her age. <laughs> Come down here. This also has been one of the dark places of the earth. Why did you say that? I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm not even exactly sure what it means. Here we are. Oh. Well. Geoffrey, hmm? what do you make of this over here? What? Where the lintel would have been. Let me see. So I wonder if they were in your line of business. Oh, they're not made by a surveyor. Don't mean anything at all. Did you? There is something here. It's as if it's in the corner of my eye, but it's not in my eye. It's here. <laughs> this isn't like your old mum. They say beetles thrive on dirt. Is that why you've got so many of them? Mother! Look at them! There's nothing there. This is a filthy house. Something happened here, didn't it? Something smelling of filth. Of shit! I could smell your father here! Mother, shall I get you a glass You smell of him! You always did! Your father is still looking after you, isn't he? Good morning, Mr. Palmer. Good morning, Mrs. Lucas. Still on 16th century costume. Oh, 16th at any rate. Parish registers. Where? St. James, Clerkenwell. Local. Uh, when? Uh, we'd better start with a dissolution. Are you looking for anything in particular? It's a name. The name of the person who originally owned my house. <coughs> Here we are. Thank you. I suggest you try the church warden's accounts first. You'll find them at the back. Yes, I do know. <laughs> there was a young man who used to come here a great deal. Tim Berry. I don't know if you knew him. No, I didn't. He had a small notebook in which he'd written certain names. He told me they were his ancestors, but not in the sense you or I would mean. The names came to him in dreams. Obviously not a proper researcher. I don't believe in madness, Mr Palmer. He had a list of ten or twelve names. He was convinced they were the names of his family. What did he mean? Well, these were people who'd been like himself, who had felt the same thing, thought in the same way. Yeah, what did he hope to discover? I mean, even if he found some of the names... Well, that was the interesting part, you see. He was sure they'd all lived in the same area of London, even inhabited the same street, even perhaps the same house, in different centuries. And then? It was a Friday afternoon, about three months ago. He'd found one of the names earlier in the week, a parish register of 1708. He thought he was close to finding another. He wanted to make the connection. I heard him cry out. I thought for a moment he was ill. He came rushing up to me. I found it, he shouted. I'll be back later. <laughs> As you know, I'm a discreet person. I, I didn't even take a peek at his desk until it was time to close. There wasn't much to see. Just a 19th century rate book from Stoke Newington. Really? He never came back. He'd left some things on his desk. I wrote to the address he gave on his application but it was returned unopened. He'd lived in a hostel. I visited it. They could tell me nothing. Was the hostel in Stoke Newington? No. I've kept his things here. I can't prove it, but I think something happened to him. Got it. Hmm? Cloak House, Cloak Lane. Yes! Sorry. I'm glad. I found it. First shown as a house after the nunnery was dissolved. And the owner? There. Oh. Now, here is a name I do recognise. John D. I know it too. I hate to tell you this, Mr Palmer, but the original owner of your house was a black magician. very bad. Well, well. If he goes before, we will follow him hereafter. It is a noble philosophy. One pleasure, a thousand sorrows. Well said again, well said. Oh, 
How does your health since I saw you last, Father? So, so. You seem to look better always. I think to have seen you sometimes, sir, but I do not remember where. Was it in London? Yes, I am of London. Shall I be so bold as to ask your name? I believe it is known to you. Truly? How do men call you? They call me many things, but my name is Dr. D. Oh, away with you, away with you. Would you have my inheritance before I'm in the tomb? I came here to comfort you, sir. You came to cousin me? I came out of reverence, Father. What reverence? What reverence from a son who close ruined my household with his demands for money? Who neglected us in the hour of our distress? I have my work, Father. Your work? No more than tricks and japes. If it be something else, then it is the work of hell. I have done nothing. Deny what you have done. If I have offended, I beg pardon. I acquire knowledge not for my own sake, but for the sake of truth itself. My life is not held in my own hands. <laughs> How poor the power you boast of. You have forgotten your own knowledge. You are through... Vanity and ambition blind. You have become a deceit. The image of falsehood. Now, look on your world, a world without love. At least, grave and reverend sire, I shall not be made contemptible and in my last days a laughingstock. I feel a thing about my head. It, it claws and claws. Look not near me now. For he is telling money behind my bed. Not hear him? I have gold, sir. I placed it in a bag. I tied the strings with a double knot for fear they might untie themselves. I put the bag at the bottom of a wall, an old crumbling wall amidst the roots of thorn. Where might I find this wall? Walk on till you come to a high elm tree. Make twenty paces forward. Then turn at the left hand for fifteen paces. Then take another five to the right. I'm afraid I am out of your way. I do not know the place. They call it St. Wolfston Wall. In the fields at Acton. Uh, I know not why. Huh? There is a very little creature there, on the cushion, beside the window, making to play with you. Do you not hear it? Hmm? Listen. Shh. It is saying... Put out your candle, for you shall have nothing more to do today. I see nothing, nothing at all. I fear, sir, that you grow foggy and misty also. Love me and love my dog. Where is my dog? Have you seen him, sir? Good dog. Good dog. Good dog. Do you love dog or God? Then shall you presently go to your reward. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. There. Here, the very edge of the wall. To the right. One, two, three, four, five. So, here, there. 
Let me commence. Do you have lower, master? I do not understand you. Lower, lower. I must have money. You have intelligence of what? my... Is it you? Are you here, after all? You talk in riddles as that Bartholomew Fair. Hush. What is the name of your dog? Dickens, sir. He is much like the devil. It is a wise man that knows his home. You would raise life in glass from corruption. How do you know this? I will not steal your treasure. There is none to steal. Let me pass. Gladly. And on the day they will all return, return to their homes, under the ground. No one shall ever be Oh, nothing. The delirium was upon him. Sweet Acton. The fields of my boyhood. The gentleman, sir. I thank you, Audrey. How do you? Well, sir, by God's grace. And how might I call you? Kelly, sir. Edward Kelly. For seven years I was apprentice to Ferdinand Griffin, who often spoke of you. I knew him well. How does he? He is dead, sir. Of a canker in the breast. I'm sorry to hear it. Yet he must have been a pretty aged man. True, sir. Very true. But before he died, he begged me to make acquaintance with you here in Cloak House in Clerkenwell. He reverenced you, sir, as one of the Order of Inspirati. No, no, this is nothing, nothing at all. If it had not been for his faithful and diligent care, I would never have reached the first step in skill or power. Yes, sir. Truly, he was a great magician? I did not say that. Mr. Griffin was a philosopher. But many philosophers are certainly great magicians. Is that not so, Dr. D? I suppose there may be some secret philosophy, but for me it is a thing not in the air. And a secret knowledge of nature? Well, that may be, that may be. But tell me, what was his work in these last days? We travelled to Glastonbury, sir, about a month ago. Truly? Why so? There is a time when these things can be spoken of. My late master... If you mean Ferdinand Griffin, then he is our late master. He spoke often of the Trinity. And what Trinity is that? The book, the scroll, and the powder. And then he mentioned once the calls, or the entrance into the knowledge of the mystical tables. And he taught me the principles of putrefaction, solution, and sublimation. The art is within yourself, for you are the art. You are a part of that you seek, for what is without is also within. Go further, if you may. Bring forth the water by which nothing can be made wet. Then bathe the sun and the moon within it. When this is completed, breathe upon them, and you will see two flowers spring forth, and out of these flowers one tree. And what is your interpretation of this, Edward Kelly? Nature pleases nature. Nature conquers nature. Nature produces nature. This is the image of resurrection. Did you learn this by piecemeal? Uh, no, sir. So you speak it from art? And from reason, which, as Mr. Griffin taught me, is always the ground of art. You have come suddenly upon me, but perhaps you will stay for a scholar's collation? Yes. It is plain food, but I hope you will take it in good part. <laughs> How do you like this wine? I like it very much. 
<laughs> Why do you laugh, mistress? The face of our guest is plain. He hated it. You are not a subtle fellow, Mr. Kelly. You cannot deceive us. The wine delights me. It has a northern taste. I pray you, husband, cut a little of that powder beef, the sight of which makes Mr. Kelly long to eat of it. Is that not true, sir? Certainly, madam, it is true. Or, or will you eat of this veal, sir? Or, or this leg of mutton? I can eat anything if it be from your table. Perhaps Mr. Kelly will try our shellfish. There is good parmesan beside them, grated with sage and sugar in the London fashion. In these cold days, no food can be too hot, and the physicians say there is nothing hotter than shellfish. Oh, do not talk to me of physicians. They know nothing. What is there a physician would have me know? Take the white of this boiled cape on, Mr. Kelly. They traffic in nothing but flesh and blood and other filthy merchandise. Some marvel how Englishmen eat cape on without oranges. I have learned how to minister to my own ills. But we should marvel more how they can eat their oranges without cape on. Do you remember, do you remember, wife, when some sorrow came to my kidneys. It was a great fit of the stone, as I felt it. And, and all day, Mr. Kelly, I could do but three or four drops of water. But, but husband, after I... I believe you must have eaten that mutton. You speak so gross. No, no. You are your own physician. It is a necessary lesson. I have something of great moment to tell you. Our master, Mr. Griffin, travelled to Glastonbury. And there he died. And there he died. Before he died... Our master discovered documents within the ruins of the abbey. On them were certain peculiar marks and descriptions concerning the original city of London. In what place did he discover them? Near the foundations of the abbey, on the west side. He found a great stone in the shape of the head of a man. It was hollowed out. Therein were found parchments, together with a smaller stone, as clear as crystal. This was a round stone? In the shape of a tennis ball, yet not so big. Our master said it was some token of the lost and ancient city of London, and you might see in the stone most excellent secrets. But who might believe all this without sure evidence? Oh, sir, there was evidence enough, for indeed I saw. You saw? I looked within the stone and had sight in crystal offered to me. Oh, yes, I saw. What did you see? A cloud of brightness parted, and I glimpsed some ruinated place where all former trade and traffic were decayed. The light in the air above this place seemed somewhat dark, like evening or twilight. Was there anything else you took notice of? I saw certain English words written upon the parchments. Uh, they were mainly names. Such names as? Sons for Zosimos, Gohulim, an ode. Why, well, I know these names. I know them very well. They're contained in books in this very chamber. The names are here. In Humphrey Lloyd, his Breviary of Britain. And they are the names of certain druids who founded the city of London. Soon after this discovery, our good and reverend master took a chill from the air of Glastonbury and died. You said previously it was a canker. The one hastened the other. So it was... The stone and parchment were left in my sole care. And now, Dr. D, have I come to beseech you to help me in this matter? Well, no doubt, Mr. Kelly, you are used to good cities. I've seen many, sir. As have I. But this ancient, long-buried and long-forgotten London was a wonderful great city. Where many say the holiest temple of this country stood... We know this buried city contained triumphal arches. A vision of old arches. High pillars. Decayed walls. Pyramids. Parts of temples. Obelisks. Theatres all broken in confusion. And a thousand fair buildings. Everything lying ruined underground. Adorned with innumerable lights. All this I have seen in the stone. You have seen wonderful things, Mr. Kelly. I have by me narratives of ancient times more than 3,000 years before our present age. When there was such power on the earth that all men were like gods. Then was founded the mystical city of London. They were termed giants. Not giants of physical, but of spiritual power. And who knows what strengths might not be ours if we found their relics and memorials. Could we not move the spheres and reach out to touch the fixed stars? Of course, I must now see the papers with my own eyes to accept the verity of them. At once, if you so please. Give me your hand, Mr. Kelly. This enterprise is so great that to this time it has never been achieved. So be merry, sir, for in me you shall want no thing. 
We shall deserve great honours from our great discovery. And great riches also. Have you purified yourself, Mr. Kelly? You know well that whomsoever attempts this and is not pure shall bring judgment upon himself. I have abstained from coitus for one day and one night. I have refrained from gluttony. I have washed all and I have cut my nails. Let us go forward then. You see the marks I have inscribed upon the door frame in the place of the lintel? I do. Describe their import to me. Sons four, Zosimos, Gohulin and Odd. This place, our scrying room, our chamber of demonstration is holy. Take out the stone. Here, sir. Place it upon the silken cloth. Let us sit down at the table of practice. Now, hold yourself in readiness for anything that may be seen or heard. No harder task is there, Dr. D. This work consumes me. Hush! Is there anything that you see as yet? You cannot see, sir. I fear it will not be given to me to have visions in Cristano. Is there anything that you see as yet? There is a curtain. I see a golden curtain. It hangs very still inside the stone. Uh, no, it moves. It is being lifted up, as if by a hand. Now, I see a young boy. No more than seven or eight years. I, I see him clearly, sitting upon a rock in a desert place. I will ask him. Who might you be? What does he say? Well, can you not hear him? I neither see nor hear him. Who might you be? I am the last but one of my mother's children. I cannot hear him. I am the last but one of my mother's children. I have little brothers and sisters at home. Brothers and sisters at home. Ask him where that is, Mr. Kelly. I dare not tell you where I dwell. I shall be beaten. He puts out both his arms to us, saying... I pray you let me play with you a little, and I'll tell you who I am. Is he an angel or some lesser spirit come to entertain us? He seems to put the air over him like a cloak. He is entering into a cloud of invisibility. He is gone. I could neither see nor hear him. I can do no more today. These things are not granted to mortal men, except at great cost. Then why speak of cost? When there is a richer prize than all to be gained. You do not mean the secret of gold. I, I thought you knew of that. No, not gold, but greater riches by far. If these spirits are sent by God, then they may assist us in our search for the contents of time itself. The city. Aye. But the secret of gold is known to you. You need no other assistance in the matter. Is there anything that you see as yet? Here is a young man coming, and he is smiling upon me. What else do you see? He wears a strange robe, without wide sleeves. He has no hose or breeches, but some kind of cloth about his legs. I see another man, without a doublet, in his shirt, and with the same cloth upon his legs. They have some little discourse or conference together. Can you hear what they say? Well, they speak softly, like the murmurings of the wind. Uh, but now I think I hear somewhat. They are named Matthew and Daniel. Holy names. Uh, now they talk of you. John D. may be waiting for us. Where shall we begin? <laughs> I saw you the other night, Daniel. I don't know what you mean. I saw you in Charlotte Street. He says Charlotte or Harlot Street. <sighs> there is no such street. I'm not insulted by denying it. The other groans. Daniel, you don't have to explain anything to me. But now both are vanished away. Is there anything that you see as yet? Now comes another forward. He is a man having a velvet gown all furred with white. And he makes motions as if to address you. I will speak it as I hear it. John D., have you been turned off the ladder of life? Yes, I have. Many times, and wrongfully so. And has the highway of preferment therefore been barred to you? Indeed it has. Well, John Dee, there is little friendship in your world. Little friendship in your world. 
Do you know Richard Pointer? Yes. An arrant knave full of indirect ways and policies. He lives yet to spread false reports about you, but his time is likely to be short. Likely to be short? I know the height of your ambition and unrest, but it is given to you to encompass all your ends. Aspire further than you think you may reach. Seek knowledge of the whole world and mint gold both material and spiritual. Both material and spiritual. I tell you this, John Dee. When you die, you shall depart this world with fame and memory to the end. And remember this, your little man homunculus that you will make will lead you far beyond the glass in which he dwells. What, sir? What mean you by mention of my homunculus? Oh, God! Now he grows big and swells up within the stone. Oh, Jesus, protect me from this sight. <gasps> Mr. Kelly? Mr. Kelly? Edward! Audrey! Audrey! Mr. Kelly has stayed with us in this house for many months, and yet we know no more of him than any citizen passing in the street. He slips in and out as if he were not willing to be seen and looks with such scorn on Audrey that you'd think she'd crawled out of some kennel. These words are very large, mistress. I've seen him examine your books. He's often among your papers when you're away from the house. He needs no permission to use my library. I've often heard him murmuring words into the air as if he were trying to learn them by rote. Why do you frown? Is there something amiss? Nothing, nothing at all. Nothing? Is it nothing that he has the key to your private chambers and goes among your books and papers when you are away from home? He is a scholar, Mrs. D, and has a great thirst for knowledge. A thirst for everything, sir. I tell you this, mistress. I would sooner bequeath all my papers to the privy, leaf by leaf, than have them examined by a fool or a thief, but Edward Kelly is not of that mould. He is semper fidelis, and I demand you afford him as much trust and reverence as I do. My bracelets and rings are gone. All of them clean gone. I was looking for my bodkin because the eyelet holes of your hose were broken. So I went into my closet where I keep my boxes of stuff and it was gone. What was gone? The wooden casket where I keep my rings. You mean you cannot find it? Where did you see it yesterday? I did not have it yesterday. It sits where it always sits. And I mean that it is stolen. But who would do such a thing? Audrey? We have no other strangers in the house. Audrey is no more stranger to you than I am. You've forgotten your Mr. Kelly. Catherine. Look, you are as blind as a mole when you are buried within your books. All his dreams are of gold. All his hopes are for advancement and the devil take the hindmost. I cannot abide him. No, I bore him. And here in my own house, I am misliked by you because I favour him no better. It is not so, wife. It is not so. Has the loss of your rings meant that you've lost your wits as well? I tell you this, Dr. D. Audrey has observed him by the path there, muttering to someone over by the wicket gate. She swears to me that she has heard slanders against you and all your works. The woman Audrey is a brazen-faced liar. Bring her here and see if she is ashamed to affirm a falsehood before my very face. What is the cause that you will not be better acquainted with my feelings for you and for your husband? I know your feelings very well. Like the ravening crocodile, you have pity for no man other than yourself. Well, I have forewarned you. I have done the part of a wife. It had been better not to change an old friend for a new one. There never was such a shrew as my wife. But words are mere words and she means no harm. I forgive her. She has been tricked by her brain-sick maid into false witness against me. Come in. Master? Why is it that you have spread false reports and malicious slanders against Mr. Kelly, who has done you no harm in the world? I meant nothing of it, sir. Only nothing? I... You call it nothing to condemn my guest as a thief and malicious backbiter? I heard him in the garden, sir. Yes? And where were you? Close under a hedge, playing a jack-in-the-box? Or was it something worse? Well, you're discharged. Do not come near my house again. <laughs> Do not be so harsh, Dr. D. I entreat you. Uh, can we not play the priest and shrive her? What do you hear, Audrey? What say you to that? I would humbly thank you, sir, if I were forgiven. No, do not thank me. 
Go down on your knees now and bless this gentleman for preserving you. John Dee paid rates here in 1563. And according to Margaret Lucas, he was a black magician. She always has something fanciful to say. You asked me how far I wanted to take this research. Yes. I want to know everything, Daniel. I suppose it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. It's my responsibility. You make it sound as if you belong to the house. As if I belong to something. Well, don't you feel it too? I owe it to the house. I owe it to myself. And to John D. Of course. In a sense, he's a part of my family now. John D. may be waiting for us. Where shall we begin? <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Palmer. Good morning, Mrs. Lucas. How is the bad doctor? You have been misleading me. In what way? John D. was much more than a black magician. He had the largest private library in Elizabethan England. <laughs> that could rather prove my point. Look at the range of his interests. His publications. General and rare memorials pertaining to the perfect art of navigation. Preface to the elements of geometry of the most ancient philosopher Euclid of Megara. He also made an astrological projection for the date of Elizabeth's coronation. Astrology was respectable then. Mm, some people would say it was respectable now. Have you come across Aubrey's account of him in Brief Lives? I've got it here. A mighty good man he was. Mm, but here, later, he used to distill eggshells, and t'was from here that Ben Jonson had his hint of the alchemist whom he meant. Alchemy is not black magic. No. It's a system of correspondences between the internal and external worlds. There is nothing in heaven and earth which is not also in man. Yes. When the astrologer sees the sun rise, the sun within his own self rises in joy. Let me show you something. Oh. Now, this is a transcript of John Dee's will. Now, in particular, here. My old rambling tenement in Clerkenwell, I leave to the one who has most need of it. I, who made him will live within him forever. He who owes his life to me will return to me. Why do you know about all this? <laughs> I have a magpie mind, Mr. Palmer, as do you, as do most people who frequent this library. The one who has need of it, he who owes his life to me will return to me. Does it mean anything to you? No. The world turned upside down. I'll get you a cab. No, it's all right. It's not safe to walk my cars around the corner. Besides, I enjoy it. Exactly. I'll see you then. Daniel. Daniel. Why is he dressed like... What is this place? You can see the sign. The world turned upside down. Private club. What sort of club? Look. Not your sort of scene. I saw you the other night, Daniel. I don't know what you mean. I saw you in Charlotte Street. I will not insult you by denying it. Daniel, you don't have to explain anything to me, but... When I dress up, I must look like a fool. And yet it is part of me. 
It gives me the strangest pleasure. It's like sex without having sex. I don't understand it at all. Did you get to your car safely? Of course. Why does everything have to be so secret, so deeply buried? You tell me. Sometimes I feel I'm excavating some lost city within myself. How did you know about the cupboard under the stairs? I guessed. Lady Cynthia That's asked... That's what you said last time. And the toys. What's this to do with... How did you know about the toys in the cupboard I... under the stairs? I guessed. No, you didn't. You know this house very well. There's no point in lying to me, Daniel. I think my mother recognised you. She doesn't know me at all. I can promise you that. What else can you promise me? Nothing. I knew your father. I came here with him sometimes. And why was that? We met in that club where you found me. The world turned upside down. I wish you wouldn't keep saying that. I don't think I know what you mean. Yes, you do. Your father and I were lovers. It was about ten years ago. I prefer older men, you see. And he was very charming, very gentle. Did he ever mention Dr. D? He did say there was something special about the house. He thought something had once happened here, and he wanted to restore it. Or relive it. I'm not sure what he meant. But that was why... It's a little late to keep any secrets. He believed in something called sexual magic. He believed you could raise spirits by practicing, well, certain things. And did he? Did he? Did he raise spirits? Of course not. I never believed any of it. But your father was different. He believed he had come upon a secret truth, some kind of inheritance. There's something else I have to tell you, Matthew. Oh, God. We didn't meet by accident. About two years ago, your father realized he had contracted cancer. That's when he asked me to watch over you. He said you were very special. Special? He said you were unique, and of course you are. He just didn't want you to come to any harm. It was easy enough to arrange an encounter. I mean, we share the same interests, and London can be a very small city. We are still friends. I have to say, I don't remember. You must do. Your own father. I don't. Sometimes he was there, and sometimes he wasn't, and that was about it. You're going to tell me I'm escaping from something. It's more interesting than that. I think, without realising it, you're reinventing yourself. You're creating some new family, some new inheritance. So you've forgotten about your own past. What about you? Oh, I remember everything. I remember sitting up in my pram. I remember walking for the first time. I remember hiding under the dining room table. Do you miss being a child? Doesn't everyone? Everyone except you. Step on a crack, break your mother's back. And why do I remember that? Wolfston Street. Norse, wasn't he? What's he got to do with Acton? Or Ealing, as she calls it. This is a privilege. Kiss, please. I was hoping to see you in Clerkenwell again. Oh, it's a long way, Matty. And the garden needs me at this time of year. Besides, it's that house of yours. What's wrong with the house? Let's go inside. I'll make you something nice. You can be very aggravating. You always seem to know more than you say. That's part of my charm, isn't it? Get that down, you. You used to love a good sandwich. No, I didn't. Don't contradict. Who's that? The lover. I know about him, Mother. The lover? No. I know what kind of man he was. And what kind of man was that? I think you know. No. I thought you had forgotten. Forgotten? You were so small. Was I? You do know, don't you? But I protected you all the time. Your mother was good for something even then. I stopped him. I only caught him with you once, but I threatened to take him to the police. I never left you alone with him after that. Mother. I defended you. 
He swore he never harmed you, Matthew. He said he never touched you. But after that, I hated him. Oh, God, help me. There was a time when I thought you and he... You said I smelt of him. Oh, I didn't mean... Your own son! You're not my son, Matthew. He found you. He adopted you. He said you were very special. Unique. I had to go along with it. I knew I could never give him any children. Oh, it was so difficult, Matthew. He was always there, you see. You were his child somehow, never mine. People talk about love, but... Oh, I knew he had a lair. That house, your house, to scuttle off to. But at least we have some cause to be grateful. We survived, didn't we? I suppose so. Have I missed anything interesting? No, darling. We were just reminiscing. Ah, that's all right, then. <sighs> Gardens need work. Come and see your mother's sunflowers. You had a talk, then, did you? Yes, we did. Ah, oh, that's good. Ah, here they are. It's amazing how they grow out of all this muck and dirt. You know, uh, I'm working on the East London Regional Plan. No. I'm not sure... Oh, we found some narrow tunnels uh, somewhere near Wapping. I thought they were to do with the sewers, but they weren't in alignment with them at all. Not at all. I walked down one of them. It was wet and slippery and smelly. I'm used to that. And then... I came across the strangest thing. It was an open space, and there were old stones there, a fragment of pillar, a paving stone worn smooth. And then there was a piece of archway just lying on the ground. What do you think of that? It's time for me to go. It's time for me to go. I'll be back. Oh, Matty. Step on a crack, break your mother's back. Now look on your world. A world without love. I pray you, let me tarry a little. Who are you? What do you want? I'm the last but one of my mother's children. Is anything the matter? I have little brothers and sisters at home. Where is that? I dare not tell you where I dwell. I shall be beaten. I pray you let me play with you a little, and I'll tell you who I am. Now look here. I don't know what you Matthew. want. Matthew! I was hoping you were here. Where's he gone? Who? The, the boy I was talking to. I didn't see anyone. You must have done. He's probably from the Peabody buildings. There was nobody there. Shall we go inside? The outside world. Gone. Your father asked me to give you this. In your role as guardian angel? I think this is the time. It's his handwriting. Yes. I should be interested to see what you think. So that it might grow without the help of any womb. This is the secret of all secrets. And must remain so. Until that time of the end when all secrets will be revealed. Let the Spagyricus take the seed and place it within a sealed glass. Bury it within horse dung for the next 40 days, together with four true magnets in the shape of a cross, without forgetting to renew the water within the glass by pouring in the liquid of fresh dew each fourth day. Then on the 44th day it will begin to breathe and move its limbs. It will seem to you like a perfect human shape, but transparent and without any eyes. 
Now it must imbibe arcanum sanguinis hominis for the space of one year, all the whole remaining beneath the glass. And at the end of that time, it will be a pretty little infant thing. It will be a true homunculus and can be taught like any other child. It will grow and prosper with its intellect and faculties until its thirtieth year, when it will fall asleep and return to its first unformed state. It must then be cherished and placed again within glass, so that this secret and wonderful being may grow once again and work upon the world. Its chief glory is that with proper care and reverence, it will be constantly regenerated, and so live forever. It survived the Black Death by taking a compound of tannic acid, which it mixed instinctively. It prophesied the Great Fire, though no one listened. It knew Isaac Newton, and they held many learned conferences in which it explained to him the scientific meaning of the Kabbalah. It created the air pump, and then wrote in its pocketbook, only our visions give us away. It looked after Charles Babbage from his infancy, knowing him to hold the key to future prosperity. It worked on radar during the Second World War. It, it remembers, remembers nothing, nothing about, about its past or future until, until it returns home at the end of its 30 years. years. But it, it always, always does, does return, return home. home. But it always does return home. My old rambling tenement in Clerkenwell I leave to the one who has need of it. What was that? N nothing. Something I remembered. And what do you make of it? Interesting. And you? It's all way beyond me. What do you want? What's it to you? Hanging about at this time of night? It's a free country. I'm sorry. You are here. <laughs> what are you... Don't, don't be frightened of me. I'm not frightened of anyone. What are you doing here? What do you think? And what are you doing? Off to dance on your mother's grave? Something like that. Where are you going now? Nowhere. Just looking for some action. Where are you going, then? Oh, I'm, uh... I'm hanging around. Chilling out. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm chilling out. What's your name? Mary. Where do you live, Mary? Over the river. Where do you live, then? Here. You mean? This house here. Oh, is that so? I've got a confession to make. I'm a bit short of money, you see. I'm out of work at the moment. Don't worry, Mary. I'll make sure you're all right. Is all this yours? No. I live with someone. I live with my dad. Oh, I thought I saw someone. You can't have. Well, he's out. He won't be back for a while. Well, where is he, then? Gone down the bingo. Oh, don't talk to me about bingo. My mum's mad on it at Streatham, next to Caesar's Palace. Let's go down to the basement. No one will see us there. Well, it suits me, but I need my money first. Here. So. Why aren't you going to count it? Oh, plenty of time for that. Oh, whiskey. Nice. Over here. Over here. <laughs> Those marks over the door. Nothing. Oh. Let me no. do as I say. All right. <laughs> now, libation. Oh, it's cold. Alcohol. <laughs> Soon won't be. <laughs> Drink. And you. Is there anything that you see as yet? D don't! D don't! I see the man Matthew, he that spoke of Harlot Street. Uh, don't leave any mark! Oh. Has he anything to say to us? 
When my father made me... He's naked, with a woman. He made me strong. She also is naked. Uh, no, in my eyes! Uh, no, in my eyes! This is a true and authentic image. I of shall an close inmost... the golden curtain upon it. I do not trust these spirits. Well, you cannot condemn them out of hand without having heard what they say. I have heard what they say. Who knows if they will lead us to some place of night and terror? Oh, be more cheerful, Edward. They are our arrows. Should we not try to hit the mark with their aid? Our teachers are our deluders. Come in. Ah, Audrey. Still at your old tricks? My mistress has not been well these two days. She would have me tell you. And you think I have not remarked it? I shall come to her presently. You ought not to play. You are sick. I am. But I play to purge melancholy. And why are you so melancholy, wife? Why? <laughs> Do you need to know? I have... This night, been troubled with a colic and a cramp, sir. And I have a megrim. Give me your wrist. Now, truly, you are sick. But you are not yet in hard case. Come now and lie you down. You must have flowers in your room. I shall have Audrey strew the floor with sweet herbs. I shall prepare a decoction of violets which, when placed on your feet and on your head, will provoke sleep. All will be well, Mrs. D. All will be well. Mr. Kelly has administered to me already. Kelly? What did he do? He gave me a cordial mixed with wheat meal and the seeds of melon. He called it a fomentation, and, Lord, it was bitter enough. I was all unready and in my night stuff, but he asked me to drink. Come, no more words now. I will prescribe mineral physic for you, and then you must sleep. The spirit says 4723 is called the mystical root in the highest descendant of transmutation. These phrases are dark. It is the square of the philosopher's work. You said it was the root. So it is a root square. The square thereof is 223026729, and the words are, by interpretation, ignis virameter. What does this signify? Enough. It is at an end. And the words are by interpretation. Ignis Vera Mater. Dr. D. Dr. D. What means this? Your wife, my mistress, sir. Tell me, Audrey, what is the matter? I was sitting with my mistress, sir, and Mr. Kelly came in and sat with us. He is much concerned for her. My mistress rallied a little and asked me for some fresh water. I went to get it and... Go on. You will berate me, sir. Tell me what you have to say. I peered through the keyhole, sir. Ah. Mr. Kelly was bent over her, sir, and giving her something to drink. He is still there? He is. What do you hear, sir? It is not fit. It is not wise. We hope for the resurrection and life eternal. Amen. Audrey saw you give her a cordial or some such. No, I bent over to smell her breath. Uh, she needs some vinegar or garden mint upon her gums. Uh, husband. She wakes. I would desire you to leave us together. <coughs> With all my heart. Uh, he has used you very grossly. And how is that? I feel it. I know it. He is no friend of mine, neither. I believe he put something between my lips as I sleep. I've heard, Dr. D, that two pigeons may be caught with one bean and two woodcocks with one spring. Can two fools be caught by one villain? It is late. Lay down your head and rest. No, oh, why should I? Now you must sleep, and in sleep refresh yourself. No, sir, I shall not be refreshed. I feel something else coming upon me. The longest summer's day, as you know, has its ending. Do not talk so. But, husband, 
They say that strawberry leaves dying yield a most excellent cordial smell. You're like the basil, which the more it is crushed, the sooner it springs up again. Or like the poppy, which the more it is trodden, the more it flourishes. Take heart. <gasps> Why, we are at Dover. It is the gulls driven inland and waiting for the storm. It is too late for hope. I am content to wait here. Is this not the time for scrying? To what purpose? In this extremity, I will try anything to... To ward off her present dying? I'll take out the stone. Here, sir. Place it upon the silken cloth. Let us sit down at the table of practice. Is there anything that you see as yet? All is in a cloud. Now all is clear again. And your wife runs out of her chamber and seems to leap over the gallery rail and lie as dead. Now you come out of your closet and kneel and knock your hands upon the floor. The servants take up your wife, but her head wags this way and that. The right side of her face and body is fixed and cannot move. They hold her up. Now they carry her out of the gate. You seem to run in the fields before them. You run through waters. Now all disappears. I thought there were only spirits in the stone. Sir? But now you seem to see people in life. It is God's will, sir. Oh, is it? Is it God's will or your own? Stop a moment. I will not be stopped. Do you see something there, by the fire, something in the shape of a man? I see nothing. Nothing at all. I tell you, Dr. D, that the stone has opened up the gates to hell. <gasps> I am bereft. Be of good cheer. I will be with you always. How is she? She cries a little, sir, when she thinks that no one watches. And, Lord, it would make her heart break to see her smile at me when I come back to her chamber. Oh, this is sorrow enough, Audrey, no more. But, sir, I must say more. There is poison in her blood. Whether it comes from his potions or from his art, I do not know. He has used so many menacing speeches to her and sat beside her all in a rage that the very air would blast her. Words are like wind, Audrey. No sooner spoken than gone. We have nothing to charge against him. I know, sir, in what privy place he keeps his papers and his letters. Perhaps there is something within them that might be brought to your knowledge. <coughs> and where may this stuff be found? In his chamber. There is a small box there which he brought with him on the fatal day he entered our house. Dr. D? Dr. D? No more now. I am away to Southwark on my mare. Uh, there is an old companion there who wishes to talk with me. Are you coming back again soon? Uh, not till the end of the day, sir. So, so, we have separation before solution. Sir? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Here somewhere yet, but I, I cannot come at it. Oh, here. There is a lock, but, but no key. Did you not know, after all these years, that I am skilled in the mechanic arts? Hand me that little silver toothpick. Sir. Now, what have we here? Do we have him? Now these are matters of high art. They are not for the common eye. He made projection of the red stone upon the like quantity of mercury. By this magistry, he hopes to obtain the elixir of virtue. He probes me. He probes me. He will tell me how that which is corrupt and imperfect may be brought and turned from imperfection to perfection. 
It is the spiritual truth to which he will never attain. I do not follow you, sir. The human body can be formed by dew, starlight, and the sublimation of amor sexus. If that is refined and enclosed within the glass, then the precious seed will breathe. My inmost secret is discovered. What's this? With his wife dead, he will be ours. Here I make an end. Richard Pointer. Practicing Pointer. Sir? We have him. He is part of the Confederacy. I'm a man in the middle years, Mr. Kelly, and apt to be full of doubts. But I believe you have done me some ill turns. I deny it. That stall, that trug, has once more put suspicious construction on me. I know that I am only your servant. More, much more than a servant. But I am in every way hindered and crossed by those who profess to care for you and your wife. It is a fine speech, Mr. Kelly, but I have encountered other fine words... Did you not say that with my wife dead, I should be within your power? I assure you that I have never spoken such words at all. Oh, no, I cry your pardon. It was Richard Pointer who said so. See, here. I have many times been informed that you had a dislike for me and my family, but my informers never had proof. Now, in clear sight, I know that you have dealt doubtfully and dishonestly with me. This letter was sent to me by the wretch Pointer without my knowledge or agreement. So why, then, did you keep it secret in your chamber? Your letter, sir. See, here, from the rich pointer. You have wickedly lied and deluded me. I speak now of the spirits you so cunningly created in this chamber. But there are things you have done against my wife, which as yet I know nothing of. I mean to discover the truth of that, you may be sure. You are impudent, sir, and overbold. How dare you vex me and tax me with such faults? You have wrought your own wreck. I command you, Sir Knave, to get out of my service and never after come within my doors. You have used me very dishonestly, Dr. D. If I owe you no service, then perhaps there is some greater power in the land who will be glad to hear of your conjurations and devilry. Who would not wish to know of the little man you so deviously desire to create? No one would believe any such thing. I will not pass one foot beyond the door unless you pay me 50 angels. What? I will be paid the sum of 50 angels for all my labor. What is this? Extortioner? Rogue? I will not... You raise your hand to me! I have no need to. You concluded wisely. There never were spirits, except of my own making... There never were tokens of a lost city found in Glastonbury. These were shows and devices arranged by Richard Pointer. I thrust myself into your service with the sole design of winning your confidence. In the fullness of time, you would reveal to me the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone. When I learned of the homunculus, I saw there was much more to be gained than gold. Yet now I doubt that you know even that. I leave at first light. Your lost city is quite gone, and my own self with it. You see me exceeding lean, but do not be angry with me. How can I be angry with you, Catherine? I feel such a lightness around me that I need neither sleep nor eat. I feel sometimes that I am rising into the air and that the case is altered with me. Shall I fetch Audrey to play for you on the virginals? It lies here still behind the tapestry. No, no, no. Music will make me weep now. I hear within it the rise and fall of all created things. But it makes true harmony also. There is an incorruptible heaven ornate with signs and stars and planets to which you belong. You will come to it in time as a bee alights upon a flower. Is that why I seem to be returning to the beginning? And I'm become a child again? Rest now. You were full of thoughts, and thoughts may prevent you from becoming whole again. No. I've plucked up my spirits now that you are near me. 
I'm quite merry. Quite merry. Should I not be happy as I move towards the grave? There is nothing more to fear. Do not talk so. But why should I not talk of happiness when these may be my last words to you upon this earth? I see you now by faith and imagination. Where there is no faith, there is no life. We will meet again, John. Until then, farewell. within your chamber. How can this be? He was at work within your room, sir, when the lamp was all overthrown. Seeing that there was some spirit of wine too near and his glass was not being stayed with books about it as yours is going to be. Then, the flittings of one side... John D. I am sent of God. I thought I should never look upon your face. I've come to teach you to look inwardly, John Dee, and to see what belongs in the hearts of man. May I ask you something? Does love always begin with grief and end with death? Is it always a pleasure full of pain and a joy replenished with misery? What good can there be that ends with such sorrow? You ask me that even now? Yes, even now. I do not know what love may be. That is why, with all your scholarship, you have found only hatred and ambition in the world. You have read in vain and done nothing but lose time. Now understand something which will be more profitable to you by far. The world is your own self, John Dee. So how is it to be changed? When you are changed. When you look on the world with love. What are those large black marks? Where? On the side of the house. Painted across the stone. It's not painted. It's in the stone itself. Scorch marks. Something has burned here. The house itself has been touched by fire. Do you remember the bridge you saw across the Thames? Of course. I think time may be a substance as real as fire or water. It can change shape. It can move to a different position. Do you see what I'm getting at? I'm not sure. That was your bridge. It was a part of time that had stopped. Have you ever wondered why this area is so peculiar? So you've noticed it too? All the time is held in this place. The outside world. Gone. Do you believe in ghosts? I believe in this house. Homunculus. The word of the alchemist. It is the name of the creature formed by the magician and grown within glass before it reaches maturity. What has that to do with me? That's what you are, isn't it? An homunculus. That's what your father told me. I abjure these arts! My homunculus, my search for a new life, was a delusion. The spirit of my wife has shown me that there is only one true immortality. There is no way to conquer time and live eternally, except through vision. 
The vision, not the body, transcends this life. <laughs> the servants are all gathered about, sir. And no more harm can come to anyone living. <coughs> smokiness. Only smokiness. And who are you? I am Tim Berry, who was looking for his family. Now it is done, I am the beginning and the end. And what of Kelly? Is he aflame? Gone with your alembic and your writings. Well, let him run while he can. A greater one follows on his heels. Daniel? Not there. I have been expecting you. I know you are a figment. My sick father's dream. You are the fantasy of those who believe in the reality of time and the power of the material world. While I clung to those illusions, you haunted me. You were my father's creature. An image of my fears. But there is a higher life by far. Quite beyond the passage of time. A life of vision. Imagination. So now I leave you. There never was an homunculus. I abjure you! And Dr. D? He disappeared. After the fire in the house here, his world was at an end, and so he vanished. How do you know so much? Oh, I know nothing, really. The past is difficult, you see. You think you understand a person or event, but then you turn a corner and everything is different once again. Did you hear something then? No. I thought I heard a voice. <laughs> You'll be seeing him next, glimmering in the corner. Well, I do see him. John Dee heard all these things and rejoiced. Yes, I do see him. I put out my arms in welcome, and he sings softly to me. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Oh, you who tried to find the light in all things, help me to create another bridge across two shores. And so join with me in celebration. Come closer. Come towards me so that we may become one. Then will London be redeemed. Now and forever. And all those with whom we dwell, living or dead, will become, through vision and imagination, the mystical city universal. In the House of Dr. D by Peter Ackroyd, dramatized by Alan Drury, Matthew was played by Philip Venister, Daniel by Anthony Afebu, Edward Kelly by Gerard McDermott, and Dr. D by Nigel Anthony. Matthew's parents were played by Stephen Thorne and Carolyn Jones, Geoffrey by David Bannerman, Mrs. D by Tracy Ann Oberman, and Audrey by Alison Pettit. Mrs. Lucas was played by Jilly Mears, Laurie by John Rowe, and the boy was James Bell. The House of Dr. D was directed by Claire Grove. Put out your candle, for you shall have nothing more to do today.